started. Thank you. Power is rolling. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon and welcome to today's stated meeting. At this time, I ask that everyone please turn all electronic devices to vibrate. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome to the stated meeting of February 11th, 2021. I am Majority Leader Lori Cumble, and I'd like to thank you for joining us at this virtual meeting of the New York City Council. If you would like to follow along, the agenda for today's meeting is posted on our website. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Adams. Present. Ampri Samuel. Present. Ayala. Present. Barron. Thank you. Borelli. Present. Brannon. Here. Cabrera. Present. Chin. Present. Constantinides. Present. Carnegie. Deutsch. Wait, wait, I'm here. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Deutsch. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Dharma Diaz. Present. Council Member Ruben Diaz. Present. Drum. Present. Eugene. Present. Gibson. Good afternoon, everyone. I am here and blessed. Thank you. Jonai. Present. Grudenshik. I'm here. Holden. Here. Kalos. I am not a cat. I am here. Ku. I'm here. Thank you. Kozlowitz. Lander. Here. Levin. Here. Levine. Lewis. Present. Mizell. Here. Benchaka. Miller. I'm here. Thank you. Moya. Present. Perkins. I do. Present. Powers. Here. Reynoso. Riley. Present. Rivera. Present. Rodriguez. After, after joining a press conference with the majority leader 
a combo, council member Conaghy and Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams, leaving the borough of Brooklyn presente. Thank you. Rose. Congress. Present. Thank you. Rosenthal. I'm here. Thank you. Salamanca. Present. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. I am present. Malone. Here. Van Bramer. Here. Levine. Here. Jaeger. Here. Patio. Here. Combo. Present. Speaker Johnson. I'm here. Madam Majority Leader, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. We will now have today's invocation, which will be delivered by Venerable Yu Wang, Spiritual Leader and Executive Director of the International Buddhist Progress Society, located at 154-37 Barclays Avenue in Flushing, Queens. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, council members and guests. Thank you for inviting me to provide this invocation for this new year. Tomorrow, Friday, February 12th, is the Lunar New Year, the Year of Ox. I hope this prayer to lose the, a wonderful new year for all of us. May I tell you about the Buddha, our teacher? He was a very wise man in much of what he shared with us. It's common in the spirits of all faiths. That is to be kind to one another, to do no harm to one another and the world, and to help relieve suffering. Now, more than ever, we need to remember these shared beliefs. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated much of our world, but we believe that New York City will stand resilient and emerge stronger through these challenges. Let us now pray in Buddha's name and the name of your spiritual leaders. Today, we ask the Buddha's wisdom to help guide our community leaders to use wisdom to govern in the conflicting interests and the issue of our times, to know the true sense of the welfare and needs of people in our community to understanding the importance of justice for all, old and young, rich and poor, black and white, and all shades in between. To protect our natural resources, understanding that all citizens, and in fact, all sentient beings, are dependent upon open spaces, pure water, and clean air. To have the ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement. Let us pray that this body deliberates in a manner that is without ill will, that brings comfort to the citizens and progress to the community, that all decisions are made with foresight and deep understanding of the needs of all citizens, and that this body leads the community in a manner that celebrates our diversity, understanding that we are all interconnected, that our welfare and happiness are dependent, are dependent, dependent upon respect and the acceptance of all people. No matter their race, religion, sexual orientation, and their original home, Leadership requires the courage to make difficult and at time unpopular decisions. May our council members have courage to lead our community today and always. May our leaders 
find personal peace and joy in their public res responsibilities by helping others and assuring a bright future for all. We offer this verse, penned by Venerable Master Xingyun, our founder of a Bo Guangshan monastic order. May kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity pervade all worlds. May we cherish and build affinity to benefit all beings. May Chan, Pure Land, and precepts inspire equality and patience. Make our humanity and gratitude give rise to gray vows. The last, I would like to use our Venerable Master Xin Ming's blessing for this year. Cultivate our hearts that blooms all seasons. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your presence here today and that very important and insightful prayer for our city and for our nation. Thank you so much again, Venerable Yu Wang. It is an honor to have you here. I'd now like to ask Council Member Peter Ku to have the honor of spreading the invocation onto the record. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, Venerable Yu Wang Shi. I would like to wish my colleagues a very happy Lunar New Year and the Year of the Ox. The Ox symbolizes strength and determination, appropriate qualities that we all need this year. Every year I host a luncheon for council staff and council member Chin and I hosted a celebration in City Hall. We cannot do that this year. But I'm sure if we stay strong and determined, we will get through this pandemic and better days are ahead. So once again, thank you again to Venerable Xi. The Venerable Yu Wen presides at an international Buddha order known as the International Buddhist Progress Society. She was fully ordained in 2008 at the North American headquarters, Shi Lai Temple in California. Venerable Yao Wen was a volunteer at Shanyong Temple in Austin, Texas, where she joined the Buddhist Light International Association and was elected as president prior to becoming monastic. Not only is she well versed in Buddhist teachings, but she also specializes in teaching children Chinese as a second language and spent many years as a teacher in both Taiwan and the United States. She has served as the executive director of Buddhist Life Shi Lai School for four years and Director of General Affairs of the Shangyong Temple. She served us here in Fashion at the world-renowned Fa Guangshan Temple since 2014 as the Executive Director and Trusted Spiritual Leader of our community. I'm deeply honored and ever grateful for her contributions to our community. And I would like to make a motion to spend the invocation in full upon the record. Thank you so much, Council Member Ku, and thank you so much for sharing uh, the Venerable Yu Wang with all of us here today. We will now go to the adoption of minutes. None. Messages and papers from the mayor. None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. None. Petitions and communications. M286, Council Rule 2.75B Report. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. Land use call ups. None. Thank you. We will now have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson.
Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday to everyone. Welcome to our stated meeting today. I hope that you all and your families are safe and well, and I'm sending uh, my thoughts and good wishes to our colleague, Justin Brannon, and his wife, who I know are dealing with COVID-19 right now. We hope you're okay, Justin, and we hope your wife is okay too. More and more New Yorkers are becoming eligible for the COVID vaccine, allowing us to protect more people from this deadly virus. But as this eligibility increases, we need to make sure that vaccines are distributed equitably. The racial disparities that we have been seeing in vaccinations are disturbing. We need to protect all New Yorkers, not just those who are best at navigating websites. Lives are depending on it. As of yesterday, 27,949 of our fellow New Yorkers have succumbed to the deadly effects of COVID-19. The vaccine gives us hope, but we have to continue to stay vigilant, wearing a mask, practicing physical distancing, avoiding large gatherings. We must continue to work together to fight this devastating virus. And as I always do, I wanna take a few moments and recognize some of the recent deaths, the folks that we've lost in our city. Sergeant William Bradigem passed away on January 31st at the age of 47 due to complications from 9-11 related illnesses. His family is in my thoughts and prayers and his bravery will forever be appreciated. I also want to acknowledge a tremendous loss for our city and for the black community across the country. On January 28th, the legendary dynamic and amazing Cicely Tyson passed away at the age of 96. She was a daughter of Harlem and made New York City proud with all that she accomplished. Ms. Tyson embodied a level of grace, unmatched and dared to refuse roles that demeaned black women. She dared to advocate for herself and unknowingly inspired so many people to do the same. We are grateful for Ms. Tyson and her legacy will never be forgotten. Thank you, Cicely Tyson for everything. We also lost Corky Lee, who devoted his life to not only capturing the intricacies of life for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in New York City, but also correcting history and ensuring that their stories were heard and amplified through the power of photography. He was beloved by so many and he'll be truly missed. Our heart goes out to his loved ones. I want us to take a moment of silence to remember all the lives that we've lost as a result of COVID-19, as well as Sergeant Bradigem, Cicely Tyson, and Corky Lee. Thank you. Uh, today, as Council Marcou said, is Lunar New Year's Eve, and we are saying goodbye to the year of the rat. Tomorrow we will welcome the year of the ox. The ox stands for strength and steadiness, qualities we all need to recover from this pandemic. I wanna wish Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Ku and every New Yorker who celebrates a healthy and prosperous Lunar New Year. Finally, this month marks Black History Month. This is always an opportunity to honor and celebrate the achievements that Black Americans have made to this country and to our city. It is also a solemn reminder of the inequality our nation still struggles with. The council's proud to work every day to tackle those inequalities and hopefully make New York a national model for equity. We have a long way to go, but this council is committed to engaging in the fight for equality in everything we do. Today, our agenda includes several bills designed to strengthen our city, uh, but first out of land use committee, we'll be voting on the following items. 110 Lenox Avenue, Cluster, a UDAP and Article 11 tax exemption to facilitate the renovation of four city owned buildings for the preservation of 55 affordable units of housing, including 37 cooperative home ownership units in Councilmember Bill Perkins's district. Angel Guardian Home is a landmarks preservation designation of a former orphanage built in 1899 and operated by the Sisters of Mercy in Councilmember Carlos Menchaca's district. Moving to our legislative agenda, our first bill is from the Housing and Buildings Committee and it's sponsored by Council Member Bob Holden. Introduction 2044A will extend the moratorium on the issuance of accessory sign violations and the temporary 
Department of Buildings Assistance Program established by Local Law 28 of 2019, while the moratorium expired earlier this year and the Buildings Department Assistance Program expired after six months. This bill would extend both for two years. And I wanna thank Austin Branford for his work on that bill from the staff. Next, we have two bills related to the city's 311 service. Introduction 1525B, sponsored by Councilmember Peter Koo, will require 311 to conduct at least five customer satisfaction surveys per year. 311 would be required to conduct each survey in English and each of the top 10 languages spoken by New Yorkers with limited English proficiency. This bill would also require the administration to produce an annual report containing the results of such surveys disaggregated by the language in which the survey was conducted. Next is introduction number 18, 1830A, sponsored by Councilmember Diana Ayala, and it will require 3 on one to post each agency's service level agreements on the open data portal. Service level agreements are commitments that agencies make to respond to a particular type of service request within a certain time frame. By requiring these commitments to be published online, the bill would make the 3 on one customer service process more transparent. Our next bill is related to the integrity of holding public office in the city. Introduction 374A, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannon, would disqualify individuals that have been convicted of certain felonies related to public corruption and depriving the public of honest services from holding the offices of mayor, public advocate, controller, borough president, or council member. Convictions that have been vacated or pardoned would not prevent a person from holding office under this bill. And I wanna thank from the staff, CJ Murray, Emily Forgione, and Elizabeth Kronk. Next up, we have one resolution and one bill that tackles bias in our healthcare system. And they're both sponsored by council member Helen Rosenthal. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the unfortunate disparities that exist in our healthcare system, a system we rely on for so much. The outcomes are not the same for all people. And we know that women and communities of color are at a disadvantage when it comes to treatment. Research has clearly shown that implicit bias has been a major factor in negative health outcomes. Today, the council will vote on resolution 512A which calls on New York State to require medical schools to train students in implicit bias. Although some medical schools provide such training to their students, not all do. Training in implicit bias includes instruction on structural racism, ableism, and other forms of, impression, of oppression in the medical field, as well as reflection on individuals' own implicit biases. And I wanna thank from the staff, Emily Balkin. We also will vote on introduction number 2064A, again by Councilor Rosenthal, which would require the creation of an advisory board to report on issues relating to gender and racial equity in the provision of healthcare services and hospitals and or other uh, healthcare services, covered healthcare services in New York City. The advisory board will consider factors that contribute to gender and racial inequity in hospitals and other healthcare services and examine existing protocols these entities use to address such inequities. The board would consist of a multidisciplinary panel of representatives and be required to submit a report, including recommendations for addressing and eliminating such inequities by December 1st, 2021 and December 1st annually thereafter. And I wanna thank from the staff, Harbani Ahuja, Sarah Liss and Brenda McKinney. As we learn more, <clears throat> excuse me, as we learn more about the COVID-19 disease and the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2, we know that early detection is critical and can help track circulation or reemergence in communities. One early detection tool is to test wastewater samples for SARS-CoV-2. The council will be voting on introduction number 1966A, sponsored by Council Member Costa Constantinides, that would establish a pilot sampling program to test for the presence of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, in sewage no less than twice per week at each of the city's wastewater treatment plants. Sampling results would be disaggregated by the site where the sample was collected, the date the sample was collected, and the date the sample was tested. This bill 
also includes a plan for increased testing at each of the city wastewater treatment plants if deemed appropriate and recommendations for making the pilot program permanent. And I want to thank from the staff, Samara Swanston, Jessica Steinberg Albin, and Nicole Aben. In 2019, the council took the historic step and voted to close Rikers Island. It will no longer be a place for incarceration after August 31st, 2027. And in late 2020, the island was designated a public place when the city map was amended. But we need to think about what comes next. The land presents us with some opportunity to build something that benefits all New Yorkers. We can't allow it to languish. The council has been working tirelessly on developing a new vision for Rikers Island. Our final two bills sponsored by Councilmember Costa Constantinides are, are focused on the island's future. Introduction number 1593A will require a feasibility study designed to ascertain whether different types of renewable energy sources combined with battery storage are feasible on Rikers Island. The city's already required to complete a long-term energy plan to assess the feasibility of replacing in-city gas-fired power plants with renewable energy sources. The bill would require an initial long-term energy plan to now uh, and also evaluate the feasibility of constructing renewable energy sources combined with battery storage on Rikers Island as part of the city's energy future. It would also include an evaluation of economic costs, value, rate of return, and sustainability. And the Rikers Island Advisory Committee would be able to issue recommendations during the study process. Introduction number 1592A will establish a process for transferring the land, buildings, and facilities of Rikers Island from the Department of Correction to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and lay the groundwork for transforming Rikers Island into renewable Rikers. In biannual evaluations, any portion not in active use for the housing of persons or providing of services of such persons will be transferred with the entire island being transferred no later than August 31st, 2027. The DCAS commissioner would have the authority to plan and coordinate the actions of city agencies with respect to prospective uses of Rikers Island for purposes that include sustainability and resiliency purposes. Additionally, a Rikers Island Advisory Committee, which I mentioned before, would be established consisting of the relevant commissioners, persons impacted by Rikers, and experts in environmental justice and sustainability. The Advisory Committee would evaluate and provide recommendations on potential uses of the island for purposes that include sustainability and resiliency as there is no current specific plan for the future of Rikers Island, the bill would require that within three years, the advisory committee submit recommendations that include at least three options for prospective uses of the island. In order to encourage informed deliberation on, po on future possible uses, the advisory committee's recommendations can be considered for further study or possible implementation. And I wanna thank from the staff, Samara Swanston, Nicola Ben and Brad Reed. I also want to congratulate our colleague Costa Constantinides, who has been working on this for so long, a big day and the work that he's done and all the advocates that have been part of this. So that is our agenda for today. And with that, I turn it back to you, Madam Majority Leader. You're unmuted, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. We will now move into discussion of general orders. We will recognize council members who wish to speak by using the raise hand function in Zoom. Please wait before you begin your remarks for our Sergeant at Arms to announce he has begun the countdown clock. The Sergeant at Arms will alert you when your time has expired. Mr. Parliamentarian, are there any council members registered to speak at this time? Yes, Madam Majority Leader. The first three are council members Salamanca, Brannon, and Constantinides. May All I begin? Right. Council Member Salamanca, you may begin. Hi, Thank you. Now. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader Cumble. Um, I rise to speak on two bills that we will be voting on today, intros 1592 and 1593, re relating to the future of Rikers Island. First, I want to make it clear that I believe in a renewable energy and efficient future for Rikers. However, my concerns are that when we voted in 2019 to close Rikers Island, 
we pledged our, to our constituents that we would do so in a way that listened to the communities that have been marginalized for decades. In the South Bronx neighborhoods that I represent, hundreds of thousands of young Bronxites were targeted as part of the systemic racism that led to a surge in incarceration numbers, whether it was Rikers Island, the floating jail, the barge, or even Spofford Juvenile Detention Center. The politicization of young and black of black and brown men behind bars was just one of the lasting legacies of the 80s and 90s in New York City. But what, was so, what so many people don't realize is how the residents of the South Bronx continue to be victimized by these detention centers just for the mere presence. While Council District Lines will tell you Rikers Island is in Queens in Council District 22, Rikers is attached to the South Bronx and is part of the Bronx Community Board too. Therefore, crimes that occur in Rikers are attached to the NYPD constat numbers in the South Bronx the 401 precinct in my council district, not in the Queens precinct in council district 22. Therefore, the South Bronx appears on paper to be one of the most dangerous and violent precincts across the city. These crime stats directly lead to some of the highest insurance rates for homeowners, vehicle owners, and small businesses. The history of Rikers intimately involves the South Bronx. As we vote on these two bills today that, be that begin the process of studying the future use of the island, my community and I are disappointed that not a single conversation has happened in an open forum in the South Bronx since the vote to close Rikers Island to provide input on what these studies will look like or who will make up these advisory committees. The plan to close Rikers and build a more humane and equitable future for those impacted by this legacy begins with being as transparent as possible, and that has not occurred. I fear that these two bills send a different message, and for that reason, I will be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Salamanca. We will now hear from Council Member, I'll say Costa Costantinides at this time while I'm reviewing my handwriting. <laughs> time starts now. Thank you, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. I, I wanted to address uh, intros 1592 and 1593, the Renewable Rikers Act. Uh, you know, the 413 acres of Rikers Island for far too long have embodied an unjust and racist criminal justice system. Generations of New Yorkers have found themselves caught in a cycle of over-policing and over-incarceration, symbolized by an island named for a family of a slave catcher. Uh, now we have an opportunity, if we can grab it, to put, a, put the principles of the Green New Deal into practice with renewable Rikers. These bills offer us a pathway to build a, a hub for sustainability and resiliency that will serve the residents of all boroughs. 1592 would establish the process of transferring the land from the Department of Corrections to DCAS. It would establish the advisory committee consisting of relevant commissioners, persons impacted by Rikers, and experts in environmental justice and sustainability, which would evaluate and provide recommendations on potential uses of the island for sustainability and resiliency purposes. 1593 would help us do an energy study connected with the Climate Mobilization Act that could help us close down power plants throughout the five boroughs. Uh, a sustainable CUNY did a study that just 35 acres of solar PV on the island could have a capacity of 14.6 megawatts and generate 17.2 gigawatt hours annually. A mere 4% of the island used for battery storage could have about 1,520 megawatts worth of storage or about half of those set forth by the Climate uh, uh, Leadership Community Protection Act. Rikers Island is placed in a, in a central location in our city is ideally structured to have host these types of infrastructure. Uh, Judge, I want to thank all of the advocates throughout the five boroughs, Vidal Guzman, Kendra Clark, uh, Marcos Barrios, uh, Rebecca Bratsby, the Freedom Agenda, NIJA, the Lawyers for Public Interest, the Littman Commission, the Point CDC in the Bronx, We Act for Environmental Justice in Manhattan, the National Resources Defense Council, I'm and of course, all of our staff, Samara Swanston, Brad Reed, Nicole Embiid, Laura Popa, Jason Goldman, and of course our speaker uh, for his vision of the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now move to Council Member Brennan. Time starts now. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, I rise today to, to speak on my bill 374A. Uh, bill was originally um, carried by former Councilman Richie Torres, who's now in Congress, and I am proud to uh, carry this across the finish line. Uh, trust in government is at an all-time low, at the absolute worst time. Because of the COVID pandemic, so many of our constituents depend on the government in ways that they have never before and are rightfully demanding 
the most of their elected officials. But instead, all too often, they discover misinformation, incompetence, and corruption among the people who represent them. Unfortunately, this declining public trust is coming at a time when we desperately need our governments to show unwavering leadership. With our budgets decimated, we have to find ways to not only dig ourselves out of multiple crises, but to envision and plan for a better future moving forward. When at such a crucial moment in history, we no longer have the time for elected officials who use a position of power to bankroll themselves, to enrich their friends or engage in wrongful dealings on the taxpayer dime. Intro 374A would disqualify those who abuse the public trust or misappropriated taxpayer dollars from running for mayor, public advocate, controller, borough president, or council member again. This legislation uh, recognizes that serving the public in elected office is a privilege and it needs to be treated like one. Numerous other professions, doctors, lawyers, educators, uphold ethical standards for their practitioners. And upholding those standards, those professionals protect their patients, clients, and students. When a profession would entrust you with the lives of others, you must conduct yourself accordingly. Shouldn't holding elected office have those standards as well? Should we not have our own standards to protect the public? To be clear, this is not about disqualifying those who have committed just any crime. Those who have committed crimes in their personal past have paid their debt back to society in whatever form should have the opportunity to serve our city, no question. To bar eligibility for anyone convicted of any crime would be to elect legislative bodies who do not represent the lives of many New Yorkers. I'm sure none of us in this body have lived perfect lives, at least I know I have. But to only allow those with spotless records would be to disqualify virtually everyone who is eligible. We're not trying to broadly deny anyone a second chance. But with this legislation, we recognize that the abuse of public office is a unique and distinct crime. To have squandered taxpayer dollars, to have abused the power given by the public is to devalue the position of an elected official, to devalue the people you serve, and to acutely endanger the public. And it ref reflects poorly on the office in question and the city overall. Some would say, why not just let the people decide? Because while an elected official was abusing the public trust, they built up power that makes it all too easy to win an election again, no matter how they paid back their debt to society. A widely known incumbent who misappropriated public funds and whose names were in headlines for many years may in fact perform better on a low information ballot than someone more qualified, deserving, and new. They might still have the funds in their coffers. They might still hold sway over voters and institutions, but why should they still enjoy those benefits? Why should they still enjoy the benefits of the power they built up while abusing the public trust? In conclusion, in New York City in 2021, there are so many talented, committed people who are qualified to run for office and who would take their oath of office incredibly seriously, but who choose not to run because they are disillusioned by the political system and disenfranchised by it. When we allow someone who abused the public trust to serve again, we do not send the message that we want qualified committed candidates. We effectively recruit those who seek public office for their own enrichment. And we tell them that this is a place that welcomes them. This is contrary to the spirit of public service and is the opposite of what we need in our great city, especially during this challenging time. And I hope uh, I encourage all of my colleagues to support 374A today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now have Council Member Rosenthal. I just wanna remind all of the colleagues that have signed up to speak that we are only speaking at this time about the bills that we are going to vote on. So I want to call on Council Member Rosenthal followed by Council Member Holden and then Ku. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Intro 2064 will shine an ongoing spotlight on the racial and gender discrimination impacting our healthcare workers and in turn their patients. Similarly, my resolution 512A calls on New York State medical schools to educate future doctors about underlying biases which can severely affect patient care. Together, my bill and resolution are important steps toward addressing the historic and ongoing discrimination that plagues our healthcare systems, improving workplace conditions and tackling implicit bias head on, both will improve patient outcomes. 
and I'm thinking about maternal mortality and morbidity in particular. I want to thank uh, my prime co-sponsor, public advocate Jamani Williams, all my council colleagues who signed on, um, and all of the advocates and healthcare workers who helped make passage today possible. I really want to thank Speaker Johnson and his legislative staff for drafting and ushering the bill through, especially Kelly Taylor, Lewis Children Brown, Sara Liss, Harbani Ahuja, and Emily Bar Balkan and also uh, Brenda McKinney. And much gratitude goes to the many advocates who channeled their righteous anger to cultivating the content of the legislation. In particular, the Mount Sinai Equity Group, the Black Women's Blueprint, UN Women USA, the CIR SEIU, the NYCLU, and the League of Women Voters. Lastly, I very much look forward to passing the baton and continuing to work with the new chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, Councilmember Diaz, who will, um, who, I, who I know will work hard to combat gender discrimination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rosenthal, and thank you so much for your leadership. We'll now go to Councilmember Holden, followed by Councilmember Ku, then Levin. Time starts now. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And as many of my colleagues are aware, small businesses are the lifeblood of our communities, and we need to alleviate their burdens whenever possible. We must be strong advocates on behalf of the mom and pop shops who are seriously struggling right now. Even before the pandemic, regulations and fines on small businesses were often burdensome and punitive. COVID-19 has made the matter all the more urgent. Uh, as you all recall, prior to Local Law 28, our small businesses were being hit with fines of up to $20,000 over, over sign and awning violations. In my district, commercial strips along Jamaica Avenue, Fresh Pond Road, Grand Avenue, Myrtle Avenue, and Metropolitan Avenue were hit particularly hard. As the speaker mentioned earlier, intro 2044 will extend the expired two-year moratorium on sign and awning fee violations for two additional years. It also extends a temporary Department of Buildings assistance program for two years, which assists business owners in legalizing their signs. And equally important, uh, the different uh, from local law 20, or the difference between local law 28, this bill would waive 100% of permit fees. Uh, this is the type of support our small businesses need. Uh, I want to thank all the co-sponsors of Intro 2044 and other members who are supporting this bill. Uh, I particularly want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, Chief of Staff Jason Goldman, and the staff of the Speaker's Office for their assistance. I sincerely thank Housing and Buildings Chair Council Member Carnegie for his advocacy on behalf of the bill uh, and small businesses uh, and, and to move this bill along. Also, the housing staff uh, and uh, Buildings Committee, especially count, Council Austin Bradford and Christopher Pepe of the Legislative Division for their hard work on this bill. Last, but certainly not I'm least, least, I want to thank my uh, Chief of Staff, Daniel Cassina, Communication Director Kevin Ryan, and Legislative Director Craig Kawana. Together, we are going to provide immediate relief to businesses across the city. Obviously, there's still more to be done, and I intend on continuing to be a strong Excellent. voice for our mom and pop stores citywide. I encourage all my colleagues to vote aye on intro 2044A. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Council Member Holden. We'll go now to Council Member Ku. Time starts now. Thank you, Majority Leader. Today, we are voting on my bill to require 311 to conduct five annual customer satisfaction surveys in the 10 most commonly spoken languages in New York City. The bill also requires an annual report be filed by the mayor's office of operations based on the results of those surveys. I introduced this bill after an oversight hearing two years ago where the city touted really high satisfaction from its customer surveys. Those surveys, however, were only conducted in English. Chinese, Korean, or Bengali New Yorkers 
couldn't voice their opinions because they were never surveyed or contacted in, a, in their own language. Residents of our city speak hundreds of languages and for far too long, they have been cut off from our city's main source of government information and non-emergency services. Conducting 311 surveys in multiple languages will help 311 identify ways in which it can better serve all our residents, especially our immigrant New Yorkers. I encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of this bill so we can close the gap and ensure the voices of our immigrant New Yorkers are heard. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, Jason Goldman, Jeff Baker, Laura Popper, CJ Murray, and Elizabeth Kwong, Emily Fogion, Audrey Sun, and my former technology committee uh, staff. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you so much, Council Member Ku. Now we will hear from Council Member Levin. Time starts now. Thank you very much, um, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, and normally I don't speak prior to um, uh, the bills being voted on um, uh, when it's not legislation I'm introducing. Um, but I did want to speak for a moment about uh, 1592 and 1593, the Renewable Rikers um, bills. Um, uh, first, I want to acknowledge um, uh, uh, Councilmember Salamanca's um, uh, remarks. And I hope that we can, um, and it, it should be our objective to make sure we are uh, including the communities of the South Bronx um, in, in entirely equal measure to the communities of, of, of Northwest Queens um, when we talk about the future of Rikers Island. Um, and so I acknowledge um, uh, his concerns that he voiced. Um, one thing I wanted to say about, about uh, this, this action that we're taking today in these two bills, um, and an additional action that we're taking for our land use committee uh, and through the land use process. Um, when we voted on the borough-based jails in 2019, we said, we are closing Rikers Island, definitively. We are closing Rikers Island. And um, understandably, members of the public were concerned that there was no action taken at the time to close Rikers Island, that we were opening four borough-based jails, but not necessarily taking any official action to close Rikers. This is part of, of the process of actually closing Rikers Island. So I wanna make sure that the public understands that this is us doing what we said we were gonna do. This is us doing what we said we were gonna do. When we said we were gonna close Rikers Island, we really meant it. And it means taking official process and that's why it's taking so long and I understand the frustration with that. But this is us doing what we said we were gonna do. And so I just wanna make that very clear to the members of the public who had expressed doubt and who had had doubt about this here today by passing these two bills, we're uh, uh, um, uh, coming through with the actions that we said we were gonna do and that's what we're doing here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Levin. Mr. Parliamentarian, are there any other members who wish to speak at this time? No, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you very much. We'll now move into report of special committees. None. Reports of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Environmental Protection, intros 1592A and 1593A, Rikers Island. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1966A, sewage tests for SARS-CoV-2. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Governmental Operations, intro 374A, qualifications for city office holders. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intros 1525B and 1830A, City 311 system. Amended and coupled with general orders. Report of the Committee on Health, Intro 2064A, Advisory Board for Hospitals. Amended and coupled with general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, Intro 2044A, Accessory Sign Violations. Amended and coupled with general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 711 and Reso 1541. Coupled on the general orders calendar. 7 12 and 7 13 court theater. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to section 197D of the New York City Charter. 
LU 717 and Reso 1542, Angel Guardian Home. Coupled on the general orders calendar. LU's 720 and 721, 4201, 28th Avenue rezoning. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. And Mr. Clerk, at this time, I'm asking that the clerk takes a roll call vote on all the items that are coupled on today's general orders calendar. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rose. Aye on all. Thank you. Adams. Aye on all. Ampri Samuel. Aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Barron. Permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, I want to wish everyone a happy Black History Month, which of course takes us back all the way to African history. In terms of my vote, I vote aye on all with the exception of the following on which I am abstaining. 711 and the accompanying resolution and 720 and 721, because I feel that uh, one of them is an Article 11, which I usually support, but I think that in both these instances, there's not enough housing that's being included so that persons who are 80% and below or even 100% and below will have an opportunity to find housing in these two projects that are being presented. And in terms of 1592 and 1593, I, I'm concerned that my colleague, uh, Chair Salamanca of the Land Use Committee has indicated that his community has not been involved in making discussions and plans. And I'm always concerned about uh, those persons who act in a manner that they think they know best or excluding others that should be at the table, some extent abstaining on those as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Borelli. Councilman Borelli, are you there? We'll move on. Okay. Brennan. I don't know. Cabrera. Permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Time starts now. Thank you so much. I uh, will be voting yes in 1592-1593, but uh, with the understanding, with the expectation that the Bronx, uh, especially uh, when it comes to Council Member Salamanca, we'd be brought to the table uh, because the issue that he presented is very real. I will be abstaining on intro 374A and vote, I'm voting aye on the rest. Thank you, Council Member Cabrera. Chin. Aye on all. Constantinidis. I'd be excused to explain my vote, Madam Majority Leader. Permission granted. Time starts now. Uh, I just wanted to, re I, since I was rushed in the beginning statement, I just want to really talk about how this legislation came to be. Uh, this legislation came to be through advocates. Uh, as the speaker said during a rally today, uh, the best ideas don't come from council members, they come from people. And uh, you know, when we talk about restorative justice and environmental justice, the advocates that I talked about today, uh, formerly incarcerated men and women like Fidel Guzman and Kendra Clark, Marcos Barrios, uh, Freedom Agenda, uh, the Point CDC, uh, uh, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, the Lippman Commission, uh, the National Resources Defense Council, and many, many others, Sunrise NYC, came together, advocated for a renewable Rikers Island, having holding meetings all over the city. And the men and women who were advocating for this bill come from all over the city of New York. 
Uh, so I'll say that the purpose of this bill is to make New York City, hopefully, if we grab this opportunity, a greener, more sustainable place, generating enough power to close down dirty power plants in every borough, the Queens, the Bronx, the, you know, Brooklyn, uh, to close wastewater treatment plants and to, to decrease the amount of sewage going into our waterways all throughout New York City. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the opportunity here, it's an opportunity for all of New York City to benefit in the long run and create good jobs in doing so. Uh, so these bills today are a down payment. The Renewable Rikers Act is the beginning uh, of, a, of a process that hopefully will lead us to a place for a greener, more sustainable New York for all and every neighborhood that has been impacted uh, by the over-policing and the stain that the Lippman Commission has said, talked about, that is Rikers Island. Uh, so again, I will be voting aye on all today, and I wish my, my brother, Justin Brannan, uh, a, a safe and speedy recovery, and wish my legislative counsel, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, a very happy birthday. And thank him for all his hard work, as well as all the staff, Laura Popa, Brad Reed, uh, Nicole Embiid, uh, uh, and, and Jason Goldman, and everyone else who helped work today to get these bills done. Thank you so much. I think that covers everyone. I try. Carnegie. <laughs> Permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Time starts now. So I will be voting uh, yes on all items on the agenda today. I just want to take this opportunity to wish uh, both Justin and his lovely wife a speedy recovery. For those of us who feel as though somehow this is a hoax or that there is uh, no validity to this virus, to, to this pandemic, um, my colleagues and myself uh, even, 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 you know, Costa, I don't want to call folks out, but there, there are several members of this body who have suffered through this pandemic and it's not over. So those of us who want to take our masks off and who want to do all kinds of things should be aware that there are people who are currently suffering. I um, mean, I just want to take time to wish uh, those people who uh, have lost, lo lost loved ones and who are suffering through this pandemic um, a speedy recovery, especially uh, uh, Justin and his wife. I vote aye on them. Thank you, Councilmember Cornegie. Deutsch. Aye and all. Dharma Diaz. Aye and all. Ruben Diaz. I'm voting C and to yes on all except uh, introduction, introduction P74. 2064, 2009, and 15, uh, resolution 1538. I repeat, no on 374, no on 2064, no on 2209, and no on 1538. Yes on the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz. Drum. Aye. Eugene. I vote aye. Thank you. Gibson. I vote aye. Jonai. Majority Leader, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Time starts Thank now. Thank you. Uh, intros 1592 and 1593 were developed independently of the Bronx. As my colleague, Councilman uh, Salamanca, stated so eloquently, criminal cases on Rikers Island have been tried in the Bronx courts, reflecting not only Bronx crime rates, but insurance rates and affecting the Bronx in a very negative manner and so many different ways. Additionally, Bronx homeless numbers are reflective of the, those that are being released from Rikers Island and reflecting the number of homeless for the borough of the Bronx. Exploring renewable energy and establishing an advisory board are good, but those were done without collaboration from the Bronx delegation. And representing a Bronx East River shoreline district, sharing the waters with Rikers and belonging to the borough that it resides in. I'm voting against 1592 and 1593, not for their objectives, but for the 
procedure, which where they were conceived. And with that, I vote aye on the rest. Thank you. Kordenchik. Hi, on all. I want to wish um, everybody who's celebrating a happy Lunar New Year tomorrow. That will be the second time it falls on my birthday, so that's kind of exciting uh, in my life in the past 61 years, so I'm excited about that. Uh, although I think like the rest of you, I'll be home, unfortunately, uh, like most New Yorkers. Um, and a happy, uh, a happy and healthy to everybody and to my friend Justin Brannon and to his wife, Lay, um, a very quick and speedy healing, a refuah shalema, as we say in the Jewish business. And with that, I vote aye on all, congratulate, uh, especially uh, my friend Costa on a long fought battle over Rikers Island. Thank you. Thank you and happy birthday, Council Member Gredenchek. It's not till tomorrow, so, you know, I want to savor every day, but <laughs> thank you. You dropped it in nicely. Thank <laughs> Council Member Holden. Uh, I vote aye on all, uh, with the exception of intro 1592A, for which I vote no. And all the best to uh, Justin Brannon and his wife. Thank you. Kalos. Aye on all. Ku. I'm aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Got it. Kozlowitz. Lander. Uh, I vote aye on all with congratulations, especially to Costa, to Councilmember Rosenthal, and best wishes, Justin. Levin. Councilmember Levin. Councilmember Levin, are you on mute? All right, we'll come back. Levine. I vote aye on all. Lewis. I vote aye on all and wishing Councilmember Brennan and his wife a speedy recovery. Thank you. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted, Councilmember Levin. Starts now. Thank you. Um, uh, I apologize, I didn't get my earpiece in. Um, uh, just uh, one last thing I want to say about the renewable Rikers vote is that um, um, you know <clears throat> this is our our last best chance as a city um, to get on a sustainable footing when it comes to um, our energy and. Um, Rikers Island, for a host of reasons, um, is not a suitable location um, for most other uses. Um, housing is not suitable there because of environmental concerns, as well as its proximity to um, uh, the approach um, and ascent out of LaGuardia Airport, um, which uh, 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 is makes a, a certain building height prohibitive. Um, it's a, a terribly, um, it's built on on um, on a on a, a landfill and um, an ash. Um, so it has a myriad of environmental hazards. Um, um, but largely, if we're going to leave our planet in uh, with a fighting chance to survive to our children and grandchildren. Um, we have to take every opportunity to combat climate change in meaningful ways. And chief among those um, ways is to, um, is to power our city through renewable energy and, and get off of um, fossil fuels um, and, and get off of uh, dirty electric production. And the only way to do that is to go big with, um, with solar, with wind, um, with batteries um, in ways that can be renewable. And so I, I think that um, I, I vote I um, uh, wholeheartedly, and I thank I'm our sorry. Chair Costa Constantinidis, and again, want to work to make sure that, that this is equitable and that all communities have a say in this. 
but I do vote aye on all, and I, I thank the chair, uh, the speaker, and everyone that worked on this. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Myzel. Yes. Menchaka. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Time Thank starts you. now. Uh, I want to speak on two, two items. The first is the resolution 1542 and land use item uh, 717. Uh, Angel Guardian Home will be Diker Heights in Brooklyn, first historic landmark. For years, I have met with community members many times, and I know that there is huge support for landmarking and preserving this specific site. Both the architectural quality and the human history of this building are immensely important, and I'm proud to be uh, here with you all now getting this done in the city council. However, at the Landmarks Preservation Committee, uh, and they are well aware, there's a significant disappointment and frustration that while the largest building is being preserved, the equally significant adjacent building known as the Mercy Building is being excluded. Uh, I'm sure that the community will continue to advocate uh, for including the Mercy Building, uh, but right now uh, we have to celebrate that. And I wanna use the remainder of my time just to comment on the uh, Rikers bills. Uh, I am support and in support of these bills and the vision that we are setting and listening to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Salamanca in the Bronx talk about his community being separated from this conversation that we can't allow to happen. Uh, so much of what we need to do is continue to do what we say we're gonna do. Uh, the fact is Rikers is still open today and we have the power as a council and the mayor um, to do that. It's still open today. And there are four borough jails on their way with a tag price of 9.2 billion. Maybe that's gonna grow. Um, that's on us. Uh, and so we have just pushed this uh, at the end of the day, uh, past the date uh, and outside our jurisdiction after this, this year. Uh, and so that's on us. And, and I hope that we can carry that too, as much as we're celebrating this moment. Thank you. I vote aye on the rest. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you. Councilmember Borelli. Thank you and permission to vote on all land use call-ups and general order items, please. Permission granted. Thank you. I will vote aye on all except intros 1592A, 2064A, and Rezo 512A. Thank you very much, Madam Majority Leader. I didn't know you were going to vote against so many things before I agreed. I know. I'm killing too much time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Miller. Uh, I vote aye on all with the exceptions of 1592, 1593. Thank you, Thank Council. you, Councilor. Moya. I vote aye on all. Perkins. Aye on all. I'll sit down and say it. I got you, Councilmember Perkins. Thank you. Powers. Lodi and get better, Justin Brennan. Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Riley. Permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Time yep. starts now. Well, first, I would like to wish a uh, happy Black History Month to everybody, and I will be voting aye on all. I just want to echo the same sentiments from my colleagues here in the Bronx where regarding intro 1592 and 1593. Uh, here in the Bronx, we feel like we'd never have a say so um, at the table when it comes to anything good, um, coming from something that came from something bad um, that had to deal with Rikers Island. Uh, everything negative that came from Rikers Island was coming into the Bronx and we had to go through a lot of you know struggles um, over here, especially in council member um, Salamanca's district. And, uh, we just want to make sure moving forward that we have a seat at the table. Uh, we make sure that we have a seat at the table, especially when it comes to the advisory board. Um, and I just want to echo that sentiments moving forward, no matter what the project is, if it has anything to do with the Bronx, if we could just make sure that, you know, we're having a discussion with the elected officials 
um, here in the Bronx. Uh, thank you, Majority Leader. And I just want to uh, wish a speedy recovery to my colleague, Justin Brandon, um, and his wife. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me, Council Member, your vote was, excuse me. I don't know. Thank you. Rivera. I vote aye. Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez. We'll come back. Okay. Rosenthal. I vote aye. Salamanca. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Now. I, I just want to make it clear that I, 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 I strongly believe in closing down Rikers and I strongly believe in making Rikers uh, renewable and energy efficient. Uh, a piece of property and creating green jobs. Uh, but when decisions are being made and communities who have been marginalized for decades have, are, are being excluded for those conversations, it's important for elected officials to speak up. And it's important for us to say, and that's what I'm doing at this stage, we need to be on the table when we're talking about the future of Rikers because everything that's bad got attached to the South Bronx. Now that things are about to change and the bad is gonna be gone, and then that community wants that piece of land and that is wrong. And so that's why I will be voting no on 1592 and 1593 and I on all, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Thank you, sir. Traeger. I vote aye and I wish a speedy recovery to my colleague, Councilmember Justin Brennan and his wife, Leigh. Ulrich. I vote aye on all with the exception of 1592. I vote no on that bill and I wish a speedy recovery to my good friend and uh, colleague, Councilmember Brennan and his wife. Valone. Council Member Valone. We'll come back. Van Bramer. I know. Jaeger. Aye. Matteo. No on 1592 and no on 2064. Aye and the rest. Combo. I vote aye. Council member Vallone. Speaker Johnson. I would eye on all. I also want to mention that Councilmember Miller, uh, I'm glad he reminded me that in my opening remarks, there was an individual that I forgot to uh, mention and recognize who died of COVID. He, his name was uh, Timothy James. He was 54 years old and he was an employee at the uh, Board of Elections in Queens. Uh, and I know Councilmember Miller has been working on safety issues there but I do want to recognize that a worker from New York City, Timothy James, uh, lost his life uh, over the weekend, I believe. With that, I vote aye on all. Thank you, Council Member uh, Johnson. And are we going to wait for Council Member Vallone? Yeah, let's, let's wait a moment for Council Member Vallone. I'm going to check in with him. Hold on one second. Thank you.
Councilmember Vallone was disconnected and he's signing back in right now. So if we could just uh, wait a couple of moments, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you. And while we're waiting, I also want to express um, my heartfelt prayers uh, for the entire Brennan family. I know how challenging um, these times are. So certainly a heart and prayers and, and speedy recovery to your entire family because this impacts everyone. Councilmember Vallone is back on. Mr. Clerk, if you could call on him. Sure. Councilmember Vallone, general order calendar. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you for a little chaos there. Uh, voting aye and all with the exception of 1592A and a speedy blessed be covered to Justin and his family. And a happy Asian with a new year to everyone. Thank you so much, Councilmember Vallone. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. And we will uh, take a brief pause while we have uh, the items on today's general orders calendar um, tallied. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. All items on today's general order calendar have a vote of 46 in the affirmative, zero in the negative and no abstentions with the exception of the following. Land use item 711 and resolution 1541 has a vote of 45 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, one abstention. Introduction 1592A has a vote of 37 in the affirmative, seven in the negative, two abstentions. Introduction 1593A has 42 in the affirmative, two in the negative, and two abstentions. Introduction 374A, has a vote of 44 in the affirmative, one in the negative, one abstention. And introduction 2064A has a vote of 43 in the affirmative and three in the negative. Thank you. Thank you. The items on today's general orders calendar are adopted. Introduction and reading of bills. All bills are referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you. We'll now move into the discussion of resolutions. As a reminder, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms begins the countdown clock before you begin your remarks. Mr. Parliamentarian, are there any members who have signed up to speak on today's resolutions? Madam Majority Leader, we have quite a few hands up. I think many of them are for general discussion. Um, yeah, I believe those hands are for general discussion. If there are okay. any members who wish to speak on the resolutions that we're voting on today, uh, can you come off mute and let us know that you'd like to be recognized? Okay, we can move forward with the vote on Councilmember Rosenthal's resolution. Thank you. We will now have a voice vote on today's resolution. If you wish to vote against or abstain from either of today's resolutions, please notify the Legislative Documents Unit by email. I'll now read today's resolution into the record. Resolution 512A calls on New York State to require medical schools to train all students about implicit bias. Will all those in favor say aye? Aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The ayes have it. We will now move into general discussion. As a reminder, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms begins the countdown clock before you begin your remarks. Mr. Parliamentarian, are there members signed up that would like to speak at this time? Yes, we have quite a few, Madam Majority Leader. Let's start okay. with Council Members Levin, Grudenchik, and Dharma Diaz. Okay, we will begin with Council Member Levin. 
time starts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Majority Leader. Um, uh, first, I want to acknowledge um, uh, Councilmember Brannon and his wife, Lay, and I wish them both a speedy recovery um, from COVID-19. I want to uh, wish also a happy birthday to, to uh, my friend, Councilmember Barry Credential. Um, happy birthday. Um, uh, so um, my colleagues, today we are introducing a suite of bills um, around police discipline uh, reform, policing reform. Um, there is one resolution in particular um, that I would, uh, that, that our majority leader, uh, Lori Cumbo, is sponsoring, Resolution 1538. Um, I, I, um, I implore and urge uh, all of my colleagues to sign on to this legislation, uh, this resolution, which would. Um, um, uh, it calls on the state to work with the council to remove the final disciplinary authority from the police commissioner. Um, this is because according to um, uh, part of the city administrative code, uh, 14115, um, uh, that was added by the state legislature over 80 years ago, um, the police commissioner has final disciplinary authority over police officers. So we go through a process where the CCRB conducts an investigation, holds a trial, makes findings, holds a trial, has witnesses, um, or uh, the police department has administrative judges that conduct a trial. Um, those findings and those recommended sanctions then pass along to the police commissioner who overrules the CCRB or the administrative trial judge 71% of the time. 71% of the time the police commissioner overrules the, the findings and the, and the recommended discipline. That has to change if we're going to have confidence in policing in our city. I'm sorry. So I strongly urge you all to sign on to 1538, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. Thank you very much, and I'll be following up with you all. Thank you, Council Member Levin, and it's an honor to work with you on this revolutionary uh, resolution. I'll now hear from Council Member Gradenchik. Time Thank starts you. now. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, today I am uh, introducing legislation uh, that would exempt the approximately 20,000 garden apartments in my district and uh, tens of thousands or more uh, across the city from certain provisions of Local Law 97 of 2019. Uh, the law was passed by this council as part of the historic Climate Mobilization Act. And uh, Local Law 97 was the cornerstone of that act and requires New York City's 50,000 largest buildings to reduce their carbon emissions um, by 50% uh, uh, over time. And um, excuse me, uh, internet's playing games with me. Uh, by 40% by 2030 and by 80% by 2050. Uh, the law was specifically drafted to apply to large buildings which consume large amounts of energy. It was not drafted to cover one and two family homes and Garden apartments are akin to these one and two family homes and have energy use footprints similar to those homes. Garden apartment co-ops are affordable housing that allow middle-class New Yorkers uh, an affordable way to own their own home. For most middle-class families who own a garden apartment co-op, their interest in their co-op represents by far the largest part of their wealth. Subjecting garden apartments to the provisions of local law 97 will not create significant uh, environmental benefits, but will harm a significant source of affordable housing by adding huge costs to these co-ops and possibly bankrupting some of them while destroying a middle-class uh, homes and middle-class wealth. So I urge my colleagues to join with me today. Uh, this is an important act um, which will protect the homes of tens of thousands of New Yorkers. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We will now hear from council member Dharma Diaz. Thank you for the opportunity. I just, I would just want to say thank you to my brother, Justin Brannon, who when COVID first hit us, he was the first one to jump and assist us in the 37 Councilmatic District. On behalf of DHS Police Officer, Allison Diaz, it happens to be my daughter, let you know that we love you, we care for you, and we're here to help you, whatever that means to you and your family. Again, thank you for all the PPEs that you've made available to us. Thanks to your efforts, many of us have been COVID free. Thank you, Justin. That is all. Thank you, Mr. Parliamentarian. Are there any other members who wish to speak at this time? 
Yes, Madam Majority Leader, Council Members Miller, Ku, and Menchaca. Council Member Miller, you may begin. Time starts now. Council Member Miller is back. Um, I want to thank uh, our leader, Speaker Johnson, for, for mentioning uh, the passing of, of Timothy James. I want to share with the, briefly a bit of the, a letter that has been drafted and sent to the leadership of the Board of Elections. On January 27th, the City Council Committee on Civil Service and Labor heard testimony from union representatives, government officials, and, and experts combined with the outreach to multiple sources close to the Board of Election, and Mr. James cast doubt on the ac accuracy and inadequacy of the pandemic measures employed by your agency. Mr. James appeared to be no less than the fifth employee employed by the BOE to succumb to COVID-19 and was one of the hundreds whom de this deadly virus infected. As a representative of work, uh, Workforce the Communications Workers of America, Local 1183 testified on, at the hearing on January 27 that the pandemic, while working multiple elections, BOE workers have been denied access to PPEs, forced to work in tight quarters with so, without social distancing in conditions that pose hot fire and safety and risk. BOE staff has labored under these circumstances while working 80 hours without, with, with antiquated and outdated equipment and under increased produ productivity pressure of the 2020 elections. Um, and I, I'm gonna jump down because this is, this is a large, long letter, but in, important. In this instance, <laughs> responsibility to provide adequate working conditions amidst COVID-19 pandemic, the Board of Elections chose to sacrifice the well-being of those essential workers, staff, particularly cruel as your agency employees and older workforce, including hundreds of temporary workers who were deprived prescription drugs and coverage due to lack of permanent status. Time expired. In recent days, the council has learned, however, despite contending with previous outbreaks, the office throughout the city, the BOE, failed to respond adequately in emerging the middle in the in the middle village facility. Unlike the Board of Election, this council cannot sit idly by while workers lives are put at risk, and we cannot wait for the contact tracing results for further investigation, which will surely be needed to assure the full extent of the board's complicity in allowing COVID-19 to run rampant in its facilities. Board of election leadership has failed the staff, the city, and in lieu of these drastic reforms, the agency uh, waiting on uh, Albany's reform, we immediately request hiring, empowering professional executive management and terminate the current leadership. Mr. James and other deaths cannot be in, in, in vain. Uh, we, we must make sure that this instance of the ultimate canary in the coal mine does not happen again to other workers. So I ask our colleagues to, to stand with us uh, and members of the uh, Civil Service and Labor Committee and the James family and calling for the resignation of BOE leadership and the reform and, and the protection of all workers throughout the city. Thank you. And thank you for the additional time, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you and my condolences to you and the entire family. I know that this was a close and personal friend and what a hardship um, this is on you and everyone in Queens and the entire family. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Council Member Ku. Madam Majority Leader, before Council Member Ku goes, I just want to uh, let you know, I have to jump off because I have to testify on the Albany budget uh, related to the city. Uh, so you're going to have to close the meeting. Uh, they're waiting for me. So I want to uh, thank you and, and thank, thank all of our colleagues uh, for, for their participation today. Thank you, Danique, for what you said. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll now have unlimited time for all members who'd like to speak. Thank you. We will go to Council Member Ku. It uh, starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, today, I'm introducing two bills. Intro 2219 will require the DOH to provide voluntary guidance to medical facilities for disinfecting and sanitizing COVID. 
one in medical facilities during public health emergencies. As we all know, information about how COVID-19 spreads is constantly evolving. So in the event of another public pandemic, we need to be especially prudent concerning best practices of medical staff, patients, and visitors to medical facilities. Intro 2218 is an expansion of the city's temporary outdoor dining program. This bill seeks to include food service establishments that do not have direct sidewalk access and opportunity to allow limited food preparation on the sidewalks and roadways. In my district and throughout the city, there are many restaurants and food courts that are not on street level, who will be allowed some cooking, provided they get permission from the building owner. I urge my colleagues to sign on uh, to my two bills. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ku. We'll now go to Council Member Menchaca. Time starts now. Thank you, Majority Leader. And I wanna talk a little bit about a bill that we're introducing today on the Office of Adult Education. Every day, thousands of adult New Yorkers are one crisis away from losing their jobs, health, or security because they lack the skills or education. Worse still, because of this, they often don't know how to ask the city for help or advocate for themselves effectively. Double for adult immigrants who suffer even more if their English gives them no sense of where to start. Imagine the desperation of a father or a mother who feels, um, uh, who's just lost their job, uh, doesn't know where to go, uh, doesn't have the access for English uh, and can't easily translate anything that is being offered to her. In 2006, Mayor Bloomberg created the Mayor's Office of Adult Education to help out New Yorkers. It coordinated across city agencies to promote adult education, particularly English programs for adult immigrants. Unfortunately, the office was not codified and discontinued by the de Blasio administration. And since then, adult education has lacked a unified center, forcing adult educators to spend precarious months every year teaching policymakers why their work matters. You know this because this council continues to stand up for each and every one of them. This office will promote adult educational literacy services, including but not limited to classes to teach new skills and pass exams for career advancement, resources and programs to enhance digital and tech literacy, and programming for immigrants, partic particularly English and literacy classes. We will overcome this pandemic and become stronger than ever before but only if we can create a foundation for a just and equitable recovery. That must include restoring and codifying a unified response to adult education. This is something that this council understands and fights for every year. I know we're gonna to continue to fight for that this year. This office will take it to the next level. Let's make this a legacy project for the city council and the work that we've been doing together uh, for the last seven years. Thank you. Thank you, council member Machaca. We'll be followed by council members Barron, Chin and Kalos. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Madam Majority Leader. We know that in the Black community, in the Brown community, there is a lot of mistrust of the processes and treatments that are a part of the medical system. We know that they are founded. We know that there's been experimentation. We know that there's been hold, withholding of treatments, such as in the syphilis uh, experiments. We know about J. Marion in Sims and other horrors that were meted out to black and brown people. So we understand that there's a great mistrust amongst the black and brown community. But today, as we're talking about Black History Month and going back to Africa, I wanna to talk to you about Onesimus, not the Onesimus of the Bible, but Onesimus who had been born in Ghana, was kidnapped, was subjected to the Ma'afa, which is the middle passage and brought here to Boston Massachusetts. He was given to a Puritan minister by the name of Cotton Mather. But Odesimus had a lot of experience of having traveled throughout much of Africa, and he introduced the concept of variolation to the United States. At that time, there were oftentimes outbreaks of smallpox, 
And Odesimus described variolation, which is the process of taking an infectious material from an infected person and introducing it through a cut in a controlled manner into a healthy person. So he described this variolation process and said that it was a common procedure in Africa and it protected people from smallpox. In 1721, Boston had a smallpox epidemic and there was a doctor who used the process described by Onesimus on 242 patients. Only six of those patients died. That's one of four as composed to one out of seven as opposed to one out of seven who died who did not have this procedure. In 1796, Edward Jenner used that concept of variolation and developed a vaccine for smallpox, which would be used worldwide for 200 years. So I just wanted to share that information. And as people are weighing their options, encourage you to look at all of your opportunities and make your decision that you think best suits you. Odesimus, I'm sorry, Onesimus introduced variolation to the United States. And you can check it out in the Boston Globe, October 17th, 2014 edition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Barron. We will now call on Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Kalos. Uh, thank, thank you, Majority Leader. Um, I just wanted to um, everyone to join me in wishing a happy new year, happy Lunar New Year. Um, this year, uh, tomorrow will be the first day of Lunar New Year. And it just reminded me uh, of, you know, what a difficult year last year was. And I'm really hopeful that we're beginning a new year. And this is the year of the ox. And the ox represent strength and determination and inspiring people to do things right. And I think this is a good beginning for us to be able uh, to push through any challenges that we face this year and help the city uh, recover from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and on our way to economic recovery. I am really hopeful on that. Even though we cannot celebrate uh, in the city council, in the chamber, celebrating Lunar New Year, or with council member Ku and our staff when we bring in this delicious uh, lunch um, of all the uh, Asian food, but we can do that. When this whole pandemic is over, we can continue with our celebration. And we just wanted to make sure that when we celebrate Lunar New Year, we also make a commitment to continue to fight against hate and to really support all the marginalized community. So I just wanted to wish everyone in the year of the ox, may it brings you good fortune, good health and happiness. So And Justin, speedy recovery in the year of the ox, give you the strength and to your wife. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chen. I think we all miss our Lunar Year celebration with you and Council Member Ku. It was the highlight of the beginning of the year, and we look forward to being able to reunite with you both once again. Thank you. We'll call on Council Member Kalos. Time starts now. Today I'll be introducing three pieces of legislation that will bring added transparency and equity to city government and our constituents are clamming for. To reform policing in the city, we need good data to know how our police are spending their time. Introduction 2217 will add non-criminal summonses, violations, and tickets to the city's interactive crime map. Is over-policing rampant in some communities and not others? Let's have a transparent, easily accessible way for both leaders in government and the community to see where violations are happening. Data help to shed light on the lack of equity and stop and frisk tactics of the past. And now this map's information can power us to continue to establish equitable and anti-racist policing policy. Next, COVID has shown us that our public school students have not only lost educational opportunities, but need wraparound services. Introduction 2215 will shed light on equity and access to critical health services our young people need 
to receive in school-based health centers and will compel the Department of Education to report on access to services, including dental, vision, sexual and reproductive health, and substance abuse counseling, allow us, allowing us in government to identify the underserved and act. Finally, introduction 2216 will require all job vacancies at city agencies, including the Board of Elections, to be posted online. Working in government should be about what you know, not who you know. Uh, I want to associate myself with council with the remarks made by council member I, Danique Miller, just spoke about everything that's wrong at the Board of Elections. No one should get a job that was never posted without an interview or having to compete against other candidates. With the pandemic, the people deserve access to city jobs and the people deserve better. I hope you'll sign on to these three bills uh, to stand for transparency and equity. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional members who wish to speak at this time? Yes, Madam Majority Leader. Council members Adams and Rodriguez. Council member Adams, you may begin. I'm starts now. Thank you very much, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, like our colleague, Idanik Miller, I also wish to express my extreme sorrow for the loss of our gentle giant, Timothy James. Um, and we're still wondering why. Uh, I spoke with him 48 hours before he passed. That's how close we were. So uh, we mourn his, his loss, an extremely, extremely difficult loss for those of us in Queens. So that said, I am introducing uh, intro 2209. It is part of our robust package of police reform. And intro 2209 re would require the police commissioner to be confirmed by the council. Within 10 days of a vacancy, the mayor must submit a nominee to the council. If the council disapproves, the mayor must submit a new nomination within 10 days of the council's disapproval. The term limit of the commissioner would also be changed from five years to four years. And I also echo the sentiments of our colleague, uh, Council Member Levin, with regard to the authority that is placed with the police commissioner. I believe that we need to take a closer look of the authority of the police commissioner within the realm of the CCRB and other spaces as well. Intro 2209 will give the council the capacity to have a part of that oversight of the selection of the police commissioner for the NYPD. I encourage all of my colleagues to support this uh, intro. It's two, intro, it's 2209, please sign on. We look forward to your support. Thank you very much, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Council Member Adams. We'll now hear from Council Member Rodriguez. I'm sorry Thank now. Thank you, Majority Leader. I'm using my unlimited time. Like you said, we have today. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, together with Councilmember Coney uh, for being with us, together with the great leaders that we have that have been fighting for the last couple of months on COVID, uh, Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams, as we together asked for the Governor Cuomo to let restaurant owners, especially those in the certain community, to be open to 12 midnight in, instead of 10 p.m and to also increase the capacity to 50%. This is racism, this is discrimination, the way of how we allow restaurant owners in Yonker, Long Island or State uh, to be open up to midnight and to be open up to 50% capacity here in our great New York City, uh, where we were hitting the heat, hitting the, the harder. Uh, we need to be sure that starting tomorrow, the restaurant will be allowed to open a 50% capacity and also up to midnight. Second, I would like to invite everyone to join me on the 22nd at a hearing that we have a chair by Chairman Ku at the Park Committee. We're going to be discussing a bill that I already have the support from uh, the speaker to create the mayor's office of a sport and recreation. That plan is intended to put a group of people led by a person to put a strategies and initiative to support a sport, to create pipeline, to see on the serve kids to have a real path on how they can start it from the early age to also be competitive when they move to middle school and to high school. The last thing is I would like also to invite my colleague to join me also at a hearing of the cultural uh, committee. we also have a bill to create the freedom trade. It's similar to the one that we have in Boston. We are intended to create a freedom trade in New York City to dedicate a specific area where we should celebrate 
all the all the fight, all the struggle that we went through to get the, our freedom. So thank you and palante todo y vamos a asegurarnos seguir trabajando para que los restaurantes estén abiertos hasta las 12 de la noche como lo estamos luchando junto con el presidente del condado de Brooklyn, Eric Adams. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Adonis Rodriguez. Are there any other members who wish to speak? No, Madam Majority Leader. I just want to close with thanking Speaker Corey Johnson for the recognition of our beloved Cicely Tyson. Uh, she was not only an incredible actress to the world, she was also my grand godmother, um, if you will. And I had the, the blessing of being able to grow up watching her um, as well as traveling as her personal assistant for about 10 years, which was an incredible opportunity to see the world um, and to meet so many extraordinary people um, from Dr. Maya Angelou to Rosa Parks uh, to Stevie Wonder and so many others. It's been a, an incredible ride and an incredible journey. And over her 70 year career, um, she has been such a remarkable uh, figure and impacting so many lives. Over 100 film, television, and stage roles, she brought her characters to multi-dimensional life in ways that seemed to defy the intent of the entertainment industry. In an era where most African-American performers were hired for demeaning stereotypical roles, Ms. Tyson refused to play stereotypes, even if it meant going without work. In doing so, she raised the bar and inspired generations of actors to follow. She showed and proved that you could be a successful actress or anything that you set your mind to without having to take demeaning roles. Although the role would be challenging, it is so very possible. Many know her for her work in co-founding the Dance Theater of Harlem, and she was so instrumental in so many films that we all know and have learned to love, from Roots to the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman to Sounder to the oldest living Confederate widow tells all. She won the hearts of audiences and critics alike, earning three Emmy Awards and numerous honors. She took on a wide range of stage, TV, and film roles that moved audiences of all ages. At the age of 89, she won the Tony Award for Best Actress in a Play for her performance in A Trip to Bountiful on Broadway. In her 90s, listen to me, in her 90s, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and an honorary Oscar from the Academy of Motion Pictures and was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame and the Television Hall of Fame in 2020. She is such a beloved figure in American history and her memory and the body of work that she created will live on in eternity. We miss her, we celebrate her during this Black History Month, and we also celebrate her in Women's History Month that is coming up very quickly. I just wanna to bring to your attention on February 15th, Monday from 10 to 6 p.m., there will be a public viewing of Ms. Tyson at Abyssinian uh, with all social distancing um, and mask requirements in place. I thank you all today for uh, the incredible work that we are all doing. Again, we extend our uh, heartfelt speedy recovery for the Brennan family. And with that, today's meeting of the stated is now closed and adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>